So are you new to bread baking, milling your wheat, baking that bread, and you started seeing recipes that include things like lecithin, gluten, dough enhancer, eggs, salt, what does all this do for the bread, and is it even needed? Well, stay tuned because in this video, we're gonna be tackling a lot of those common additives people say to add to bread, as well as kind of giving you some helpful information. So whenever it comes to tweaking your recipes, you, you'll be able to know what to add. Hey everyone, welcome back to Grains and Grit. My name is Felicia, and on this channel, we talk all the things, real whole grains, milling your wheat, all the things, baking bread from a biblical perspective. If you're new here, welcome. Been here before, welcome back, you know I love you. Okay, so on this video, <laughs> It's going to be more of a technical video this time because we're going to be tackling a lot of the additives that you may see in recipes, you may have heard about, wondering, do I need to add them? What do they even do? All of those things. If you're wanting to know about a specific one, I will be having timestamps below so you can skip around and get the information you need if you're just here for one particular additive. So the additives that we're going to be talking about today is lecithin, gluten, vitamin C or sorbic acid, dough enhancer, and then we're also going to be tackling the common ones such as baking soda, baking powder, eggs, and salt. All right, so let's get down to it. This is going to be a more technical video and I'm going to be doing something that I typically don't do and that is reading off some notes because I want to make sure I get everything right. So if you notice on my basic bread recipe, I actually do not have any of these additives really because I'm just fine for me. I just don't need it. And that's really my general experience with additives is if you don't need it, you know, why bother? <laughs> so let's start off with lecithin. A few things about lecithin. First of all, what does it do? Lecithin helps achieve greater loaf volumes and it also helps increase shelf life as well. So in my experience, it definitely softens the bread a bit more, but a word of caution with lecithin. I do not recommend soy lecithin, predominantly because most of the soy lecithin is genetically modified. And also soy has been known to really kind of mess up with the hormones as well. So if you already have hormonal issues and you definitely want to avoid those GMOs, don't get the soy lecithin. There is a sunflower lecithin. That's the one that Bread Breakers talks about. Um, and I'll be linking all of these additives below in case you're wanting to know um, where you can get them from. But sunflower lecithin is the lecithin that I recommend. So bottom line, the reason for lecithin is helps mainly just soften the bread. I haven't really experienced it, you know, helping with the rise. I mainly notice it in the softening. Next one. Gluten. Now, mainly when you're purchasing that, it's going to be called vital wheat gluten. And all this is, is just gluten from wheat berries. It's nothing crazy. They just extract the gluten. It's in a powder form. It's white. So make sure you label it so you don't get confused with other white powders like baking powder and all of those things. And you guessed it. The point of vital wheat gluten is to help your bread rise. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. A lot of people I've noticed recommend that possibly, especially with freshly milled grains because the bran can kind of cut into that gluten a bit. But I've just kind of noticed a lot of that is good technique and making sure you're using the white wheat to help your bread to rise. And I haven't really, I've never really needed it in my breads. Of course, if you already have sensitivities to gluten, I certainly would recommend not adding additional gluten just to kind of be on the safe side. All right, so next up, maybe a surprise to you guys, but vitamin C or sorbic acid from what, whenever that's what you go to actually buy. And this was actually a surprise to me. I saw this about a year ago of adding vitamin C to bread and I have tried it before. And at first I just thought, oh, adding vitamin C is a good idea because um, wheat, um, wheat berries is just slightly deficient in vitamin C for your daily needs. And so this is an excellent way to actually add in that vitamin C to your wheat and easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It actually does, and I just thought doesn't really do much maybe to the bread, but I actually was surprised because in my experience, I did notice that the bread was a bit softer using vitamin C. So that's been my experience, but in my research, it also says that it helps strengthen 
the gluten as well, which if the gluten is strong, it's gonna help your bread to rise. So apparently it can help with the rise, but I noticed it most in the, you know, getting the bread softer. But again, bonus, it's just adding additional vitamin C to the bread that is already slightly deficient with that anyway. Another common um, additive that I see that I actually get questions about is dough enhancer. And you can buy this, it just says dough enhancer. And I've seen that this varies of what it is from company to company. So the general idea with a dough enhancer is that it helps contribute to fluffier and lighter texture in your bread loaves longer shelf life and increases your dough strength. Now, again, this is going to vary based on which one you're purchasing because it may say different things because I have noticed that the ingredients definitely vary with dough enhancers. So I've seen dough enhancers that have, have a combination of whey, lecithin, yeast, salt, vitamin C, and other ingredients. While other dough enhancers I've seen have rice starch, fatty acids, and some other things that I cannot pronounce. So I highly recommend reading those ingredients, especially if you're looking out for any genetically modified ingredients, things like that. Now, I personally have never tried dough enhancers, but whenever I was researching this, from what I was seeing, it's it's possibly something that I may use in experience, experimenting with cakes to get a lighter and fluffier texture in cake so more of a lighter baked good but again i haven't experienced i have no experience with dough enhancer if you have be sure to comment below so other people can get ideas from you so those are the common additives um, that you generally might see that are optional um, in many bread recipes again i don't use any of these in mine because i just haven't found a need for it <laughs> Now, before getting into the next batch of common ingredients that I generally do use in my breads, let's talk about today's sponsor. All right, so where's a good place to get many of these things, the lecithin, the dough enhancer, um, and any and other ingredient basically to bread baking, and that is, you might have guessed it, Pleasant Hill Grain. I love this company. I will probably never stop talking about them. <laughs> Pleasant Hill Grain is wonderful because they not only have the grains, they have the grain mills, they have the mixers, and they even sell a lot of these additives, including butter and olive oil and ghee. If you want that um, honey, which is a common ingredient that we use, baking powder, baking soda, um, all of these things. So basically, it's just a one-stop shop for so many things that we use here at Grains and Grit. And bonus points, you're not supporting the big, huge companies like Amazon or Walmart. When you shop with Pleasant Hill Grain, not only are you having a pleasant experience because they have wonderful customer service and all the quality is top notch. I still stand by, they are the cleanest grains I have ever received from anyone. But you're also shopping with a family owned business. So if you haven't shopped at Pleasant Hill Grain already, you're definitely missing out, especially if you've had some frustration with other companies of not getting what you ordered and maybe some bad quality with the grains and other things that you've received. So to shop, just go to grainsandgrit.com slash PHG. Tell them I sent you if you ever talk to them. And thanks so much Pleasant Hill Grain for sponsoring this video with Grains and Grit. All right, so on to the next batch of um, ingredients that we, these are just typical ingredients that we use in our breads that I definitely use all the time, but I'm gonna talk about them because if you understand how these work, when it comes to tweaking recipes or making your own recipe, if you understand how they work, you're gonna have more success with your recipes. And this is something that I've definitely had to learn because I make my own recipes and I've had to convert recipes and this certainly helps. First off, baking soda. We're also gonna talk about baking powder, but let's go in order. <laughs> baking soda, also known as sodium bicarbonate. It is quite fascinating how baking soda works. So first of all, you need to know how it works. It, I'm gonna be reading from my notes. <laughs> it becomes active when combined with an acidic ingredient like lemon juice or buttermilk. Um, and once it's activated with the acid, it creates carbon dioxide, which allows baked goods to rise and become lighter and fluffier. 
So it's certainly important. Um, now again, I don't have this in my typical bread recipe, but we certainly have it in our muffins, our pancakes, and various other recipes. So that's step one. So baking soda, the key thing here is that it needs to be combined with an acidic type ingredient for it to even work. But the point of baking soda, it's once activated, creating, you know, the carbon dioxide creates those wonderful bubbles that helps to make things lighter and fluffier and helps things to rise. It, which leads from baking soda to baking powder. Unlike baking soda, it is a complete leavening agent. It includes baking soda. So baking powder has sodium bicarbonate, but it's also including the acid needing, um, needed for it to rise. And cornstarch is typically added to baking powder to ensure that the acid and the base are not activated while in storage because that would be bad. <laughs> now here's the thing with baking powder is you've probably seen where you have single acting and double acting. Usually recipes do not specify which one. And that's because no need to panic. Single acting baking powder is predominantly used by food manufacturers. The baking powder that you are buying from the store is pretty much always double acting. And what that means is for double acting, it means it creates two separate actions. One, when it is initially combined with the liquid at room temperature. And then a second reaction is when the mixture is heated. And this is important. I know, stay with me here. I know it's technical, but this is important because an extended reaction is preferred. Otherwise, your rising would happen all at once and it, it would be, it would just be too fast. So if you're creating your own recipes, when to know to use baking soda versus baking powder. And the main rule of thumb is that if a recipe calls for an acid like cream of tartar, buttermilk, citrus juice, vinegar is another one. Baking soda can be used because it's gotta be, again, it doesn't come with its own acid to activate. An acid has to be added. Baking powder is typically used when there's no acid added to the recipe. Now some of course call for both to confuse all of us. So for example, uh, the muffin recipe does call for both. But hopefully that's helpful, the difference between baking soda and baking powder to help you because I've noticed with some of my recipes, um, like my muffin recipe, whenever I add, I use einkorn instead of a hard wheat, I've noticed I actually generally need to up the baking powder just a little bit to help it rise a bit more because einkorn needs a bit more oomph. <laughs> All right, so next up with typical ingredients used for bread and what they are for, um, eggs. <laughs> I know this may be a surprise, what do eggs and how do they, what do the eggs do and how do they affect your bread? So first of all, there are a few things to consider with eggs. First of all, they are a rich source in protein. So they are increasing the amount of protein that you are consuming in your bread, which can definitely be a good thing. Because it's also increasing in protein, it actually supplements the gluten and helps bind the dough together more. Thus, if the gluten is stronger, it's helping the bread to rise and it also contributes to a softer, fluffy bread. Now, one thing to consider with eggs is it does increase the browning with breads and pastries. Think about whenever you do an egg wash on the top of breads, that's to get that browning effect. So just keep that in mind when using eggs. Next up, last but not least, salt. What does salt do to our breads? And is it important? Can you leave it out? One, I would say no, don't leave salt out. For the very least is the fact that salt just makes it taste better. Now I do recommend using a good quality salt and I love Redmond's Real Salt. I have a coupon code for you guys. I'll be listing that below. But what salt does is it actually tightens those gluten strands, thus making them stronger. And when the gluten strands are stronger, you guessed it, it helps the bread to rise. Now we do hear that you don't wanna combine your salt with your yeast because yeast and salt, they're not friendly, they don't get along. Um, but that's actually can be a good thing because this, uh, if salt was not added, your yeast would be faster and thus making it rise faster. But with a really fast rise, sometimes you you're gonna possibly sacrifice on the flavor of the bread and possibly a weaker structure as well if it just rises 
too fast. So the salt kind of helps counterbalance that as well. All right, now to really go down the rabbit hole, I know this wasn't super detailed. I never told you how much to add. Um, those are things that you can research or follow the recipe that it comes with. But if you really wanna go down the rabbit hole and get your brain wrapped around this, I do recommend a YouTube channel called Chain Baker. Now he does not use freshly milled wheat. He generally uses store-bought flour. But if you go to his playlist, and I'll link the playlist below, the playlist is called Principles of Baking. That's a long playlist, but he has several videos in there that are fascinating, showing, you know, what eggs do to bread, what does salt do to bread, and he actually has the examples and really talks you through it. So that's if you're really wanting a deep dive into these, I highly recommend checking those videos out. All right, so that's it. I know this was a technical video. Thank you so much for hanging on if you're still here. I hopefully this, hopefully this was helpful and informative and helps you kind of wrap your brain around the bread baking process. When you're switching over to freshly milled wheat with your baked goods, there is some tweaking involved um, sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes there is. It's first of all, you got to understand to make sure that you're using the right type of wheat. And the second thing is, hey, my bread's not rising as well. What can you do to fix it? And this kind of helps you start the tweaking process. And again, I will be listing a lot of these ingredients below and any coupon codes. Be sure to shop Pleasant Hill Grain, grainsandgrit.com slash PHG to support a great company. And as always, hope you'll have a wonderful day and I'll see you next week. Bye.